Welcome to Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community Call. This is the Tuesday, 8 a.m. Pacific uh, Community Call happens every single week, except for the holiday season in, in the wintertime. And we will have a summer break around from end of June until around mid-August. We will communicate that uh, earlier as we start uh, seeing that within the horizon. We are actually booking already in June, which is pretty cool. So there's a high demand for these calls across the different organizations in Microsoft, which is great. Now, my name is Vesa Juvonen. I'm a Principal Product Manager in the Microsoft 365 platform areas, and I'll be your host today. Today, we will have a great uh, set of uh, presenters and demos, but before we go there, uh, we do cover a few updates and news from the Microsoft 365 uh, platform, including some Power Platform uh, topics, of course, as well. Now, we will cover some classically repeating slides, and we do know that some of you might be like, why are we always seeing the same slides? Come on! But there's always new people. There's always new people in this call and we want to make sure that the new people are aware of all of all of the assets and opportunities they have to engage with the community so that's why we are uh, recapping quite a few slides in the intro then we'll go through the latest news within last week which is a lot a lot 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 news on the especially in microsoft 365 developer side of the house and then we'll do the crew photo uh within uh, the microsoft teams to get a mode uh, picture and quick graphic diff animation out of that and then we go to the actual stars of the day so Bob German is going to start to uh, show us a really cool Microsoft Teams meeting app, which uh, which has a live share SDK in use. And after that, we'll have Rajiv Chanda uh, joined by some of his colleagues and talk about the latest on Microsoft Graph connectors. And then Stefan Van Ruyen, actually not from Microsoft, um, but this is a bit of an exception uh, because Stefan actually won or is one of the winners within the Microsoft Graph Hackathon event. Um, and we kind of cover some of those uh, demos or some of those solutions within here. So we thought about that we'll book those plots in the Tuesday call, but there's a lot of, lot of cool things there. Thank you, St uh, Stefan, for volunteering for the first setup. Now, a few uh, classic slides, which we always go through. We do have our YouTube channel where we're talking way too fast. We do have our YouTube channel where we do publish uh, all of the community call recordings and individual demos. We do publish at least one new video in every single day within that channel. Uh, so subscribe to that today so that you can easily follow up on what's happening there. We also have our LinkedIn group, which is a relatively new thing uh, where we want to actually continue discussions. So rather than always just rely on the chat what we have during the call which is by the way also a way of engaging and you can also go to the linkedin group and have a discussion so this is a group where you can have a discussion inside of linkedin rather than having on one side of communication from us to watch you you can ask questions and, and share your findings as well. We do have a lot of open source assets available in a GitHub, but as it might be a bit difficult to find what's relevant for you, we also have a lot of sample galleries, which are really intended to make it easier for you to find the relevant sample for you. A lot of the samples, or actually I think all of the samples are under MIT license, so you can actually take advantage of them. And main idea of providing all of the samples is that you can actually find a sample which is addressing your business case, or whenever you write something or build something, it's like, oh, this why would I do this? Hmm, let me have a look on if there is an existing sample which is doing that, and then you can get yourself unplugged on that scenario, what you were looking into doing. If you're wondering that there's too many URLs to remember, luckily it is actually only one, which is AKMS community forward slash home, from where you can find all of the different assets mentioned here. Now, we do have quite a few community calls which we are executing throughout the month. We have the Tuesday, 8 a.m. Pacific time, which is happening and which where you are right now today. We also have a specific Power Platform monthly community call where we more have a community presenters. We also have Microsoft Identity monthly call, Office Settings monthly call, and then we have our 7 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday series. Every single week, 7 a.m., it's either Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community, where we mostly have community demos, and then Viva Connection and SharePoint Framework community call, which is also mostly community demos. Uh, we do welcome you to do demos on these. Before we go to that one, uh, you can always download the recurrent invites from AKMS community calls, and if you're wondering on what is the agenda for next week, you can always go to the meetup or sign up for the meetup. So you will get notified as long as whenever we are actually adding the agenda to the meetup system. So every single like Wednesday, Thursday, we do create the next week agendas. Um, and that is really easy way to then get an email to your inbox, which is saying next week, these other events, what is happening. It's quite convenient. 
Now, as I said, a lot of the community calls are actually presented, or the demos in the calls are presented by the community. So we do welcome community presenters. This is a great way of getting exposure. If you're looking into getting an MVP status, maybe with Microsoft, or just practice your presentation skills in a hybrid mode or in this remote mode, yeah, sign up for the demos and we'll get you scheduled uh, for the community calls. The Thursday call series happening 7 a.m. every single Thursday, just to recap, we will not have a summer break, so that will go through all the way through summer summer, and all the way through holiday season in winter time as well. Well, winter in Pacific, sorry, in Northern Hemisphere, winter in Northern Hemisphere is actually summer in the Southern Hemisphere, which is so confusing. That's a separate discussion. Now, getting started for Microsoft 365 development, we do have a, a way of getting you a Microsoft uh, free Microsoft 365 uh, E5 tenant with 25 accounts, so you need to subscribe to that program. Now, there has been some strictness related on that program, so you can only get a one tenant for a one uh, uh, phone number right now. We're looking into potentially alternative options in future. There's an interesting set of discussions how we could actually get, for example, training tenants provided maybe for you in the future, uh, but for more details on all of that uh, later on. We do also have a lot of, lot of training material available in the Microsoft Learn, AKMS forward slash M365 Dev Learn, and the 73 modules uh, already for Microsoft 365. Now that I'm saying this out loud, I'm going to say and call out the David Warner. And David, we should actually get to the reference point and the link for Microsoft, uh, the Power Platform uh, modules here as well. Just a reminder for me and you. Now, on the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform podcast, we do have three different setups available. So we do have Microsoft 365 Dev Podcast, uh, hosted by uh, Jeremy Thaik and Paul Shuffling uh, or Aisha Bass, uh, covering uh, different developer topics there. We have the BMP Weekly, hosted by yours truly and Waldeck MasterCards, uh, uh, released, surprise, surprise, every single week as well, um, and covering uh, a bit more broadly in the Microsoft 365 uh, Cloud Stack and with the uh, visitors as well. Irvin Van Hoonen from Rencore, the CTO of Rencore, was actually visited this week. Power Platform Connectors Connections is a relatively new one. I think they're at the episode number nine or ten, and, and that's hosted by David Warner and Hugo Bernier. There might be some familiar faces visiting that one later this week. Now, we mentioned the sample galleries uh, already. Uh, we do have a lot of, lot of samples available. So we have more than 1,500 samples available. And so we created this one unified sample gallery where you can actually go and find the relevant sample for you. So if you go to AKMS, for as community samples, you can filter based on your need, based on your requirement, the samples, what you want to have a look. And you can contribute. So you will actually get recognized by our site and, and you will get recognized by Microsoft for your contributions. Now, if you're looking for consuming, you find the sample, you click the sample, go to the GitHub, you'll be wondering maybe that, hmm, okay, I don't know how would I actually then start using the sample. Luckily, we do get you covered. We have our sharing is caring initiative and David is in the call to talk about that one. Awesome. Thank you, Vesa. As Vesa mentioned, you may get to that hub of Gits and go, what's a Git? What do I do with this thing, right? Well, it's used to host all those samples, the amazing samples that you're all providing, and we love you for them. Uh, but you may want to submit your own. You may want to use them, uh, and it's a little bit frustrating in how to navigate that landscape, right? So Sharing is Caring is a program that provides hands-on guidance. What does that mean? It means we're going to join a call with you live. And we are going to show you and work through how to do things together, like submit a pull request, use samples. Uh, perhaps you want to set up your workstation for SPFX development, or uh, you would like to understand better how to use VS Code, or as Vesa mentioned, we welcome you to present. These sessions are all safe space. Uh, we are scheduling more and more now as we get closer into uh, summer. So please definitely keep an eye out at ak.ms slash sharing is caring. We've got our Power Platform Samples contributor next week on Monday. So uh, definitely get over to that keyboard and type away, pull up that website, and register for that if you'd like to learn more. They are all, again, free to join, no cost at all, uh, and we're always looking for more topics is to discuss. So if you'd like to uh, see us cover a session or a topic, let us know. Vesa, back to you. Excellent. Thank you, David, on that one. Uh, and Ralph, yes, uh, it's not too early on celebrating that one, just to call your chat uh, comment out. Now, uh, we do have a few different uh, big events coming up on uh, the spring. Um, uh, we'll, first of them uh, will be the Microsoft 365 conference uh, in May 2nd to May 4th, where we have pre presenters, a lot of interesting announcements and new stuff getting announced there as well. Um, this is probably the biggest CVP, EVP president level uh, representative group, where, what we have seen actually in Microsoft uh, event for a long, long, long time. So that's going to be a really, really cool event. 
to join if you have the option to fly into Las Vegas uh, and have uh, spent time with us and there for a few days. Now, later in May, uh, we have also the European Collaboration Summit 2023, which is looking into having 2,500 attendees uh, and 30 Microsoft speakers, 12 RDs and 80 Microsoft MVPs. So a lot of, lot of great presenters there as well. Uh, I will be actually in both personally talking if you're interested on anything what I talk, um, but there will be, of course, a lot of other options and, and presenters in both of these conferences as well. The European Collaboration Summit is happening in 24th to 26th of May 2023. And then uh, on the US side of the house, the June 12th to June 16th, when we have 365 Educon, that's the first one on the 365 Educon series, then later on Seattle and Chicago, great ways of engaging uh, with the community and meeting people in person, now that we can finally properly start doing that, which is awesome. Now, then coming back on this side of the pond, uh, we have the European Power Platform Conference happening in Dublin in 20 to 22nd of June. Uh, great way uh, also meeting people. Uh, I know a lot of people actually flying over uh, from the US as well for that one. Now, we do have also a lot of different events happening globally, which are a bit smaller than those. Uh, so there are, if you go to communitydays.org, uh, you can see all of the different events happening uh, across the world and organized by individual event organizers. So not necessarily by Microsoft. And, and these events might have a cost, might be free, they might be remote, they might be in person. So you always want to check the latest details on that. But a lot of, lot of opportunities to actually meet other people within the community. Quick recap on the news, a uh, lot of lot of news on the Microsoft 365 developer side. Uh, the latest news actually is, is that we announced uh, the SharePoint framework 1.17 to go GA. That happened uh, 30 minutes before this call. There was a Sky for Business usage report deprecation in Microsoft Craft. There was a top five apps or validation errors in Office add-ins. That's an interesting article as well. If you are submitting your Office add-ins to the store, understand what would be the typical ways of getting stuff uh, declined in the store. Announcing Hack Together and the Craft and uh, .NET winners, and that's why we have Stefan actually doing one of the demos today. So who are the people and what was actually built within that hackathon? That was really, really cool hackathon happening from 1st to 15th of March. There was Microsoft Craft Developer Proxy 0.6 version released as well. Awesome, awesome community tooling. And there was a uh, really big event last week around build once, deploy efficiently, connect across uh, connect across Microsoft 365. And, and Robbie wrote an article related on that one as well. So how can we build applications in a Microsoft 365, which is not only about Microsoft Teams, but also expanding to Outlook and Office Scrum and so on. Uh, so really, really cool uh, new options there. On the other blocks, it was relatively quiet. So it's an interesting to see that development side, massive amount. But on the SharePoint block, there was a SharePoint roadmap pit stop March 2023, um, which is a great monthly summary on what's happening there, not only on SharePoint, also Viva, also OneDrive and so on. So all of the things which are related on SharePoint or dependent on SharePoint, because SharePoint is actually behind of a lot of these features which the second article is all about so actually behind of the teams behind of the even loop com and, and the loop app actually a lot of the loop components and loop files are being stored in sharepoint so it's it's an interesting storyline explaining that and then there's the promotion on the Microsoft 365 conference if you can get there so all of the the sessions are getting called out on that blog post really really good uh, summary there before we go to the actual stars of today, let's do a quick crew photo uh, for those who are willing to enable their camera. I will start my uh, re uh, Camtasia recorder and I will change the views. And one second, let me get you all in here. Oh, that's a lot of people actually in the squares, but let's do a to get them out. It's, it's a bit better there. And let's do the classical default one. And let me put my camera on as well. A lot of, lot of familiar faces. Once again, 50 seats in a room. Oh, I just got in there and I think we are fully packed. Let me put the recording on. Let's do some hand waving. Three, two, one. Thank you everybody for joining. Awesome to see you on the call. Awesome to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of smiles. This is always good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> awesome, thanks for that one. Really, really good. Good to have you in the call. Let's actually move that away from there and move then to the actual stars of the day right on schedule 50 minutes per demo we'll start with bob move the right shape and then stefan as the last one and bob we're going to talk about live share sdk are you sharing yeah. stuff live then yeah thanks so much and i'm going to run the demo live too so it'll be hopefully live all around or maybe not we'll see exactly. uh, welcome we'll everybody see. this is a sample that came out a bit of time ago 
And uh, we've been having a lot of fun with it in my team. And it was built with the Teams Toolkit. So I'm going to start by, I'm going to demo it locally. And I'm just going to go ahead and start the build process here so you can see. And then tell a little bit of the story uh, as we're going. Notice that Teams Toolkit is doing all these things that you'd otherwise have to do manually. It's, um, you know, it's it's building, not only building the solution, it's, um, you know, provisioning a place to host it and 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 a bunch of other stuff. So this actually started because my team in developer advocacy is distributed all around the world. In fact, Rabia and I did this for our Hack Week project, and Rabia is unfor is hopefully sleeping. She is it is one in the morning, one seventeen a.m. in her time zone. So uh, she was she says hello, but she wasn't able to join us. And the challenge we had was that we would have a team meeting, we would kind of go around Scrum style, and nobody really wanted to be the first one to talk or to, you know, there was just this big awkward silence whenever we started the meeting. So we built, actually somebody in the meeting asked for this and uh, we decided to take it on as our Hack Week project. And I wanted to learn about the Fluid Framework and Teams Toolkit and also the LiveShare SDK, which will get us to the, the Fluid Framework. So I'm gonna show the code for that. But now let me just show what this does. I'm gonna add it to a meeting. I've got a meeting set up already for the PNP demo. And uh, again, Teams Toolkit, you saw how hard I had to work to deploy that. I just clicked one button. And it turns out that Teams tab apps have to have a configuration page, whether you want one or not. It's just the way the architecture works. And so this is a kind of nothing to see here, folks, configuration page. And now here's the, here's the solution, but these tab apps only work with a live share SDK inside of a meeting. So I actually have to join the meeting to make this happen. And now um, sort of nothing up my sleeve, but I'm actually in two Teams meetings at the same time. And you can see here is, it's gonna connect to the Fluid service and here is the solution. And we decided to keep it really simple. I'm gonna join as a second user here just to kind of make the point. So let's join as Katie as well. She's my favorite fictitious user. And so now I can position these side by side. And you can see that you just type your name in here. And if you wanna talk, and everybody immediately gets it. I'll type in a few other PNP personalities here. And, uh, and they're showing up on both sides. What's kind of cool now is that you can do things like advance to the next speaker, which just sort of pops the stack. Sorry, I keep covering up my own window. I guess I'll, I'll interact on this other side. You can also do things like shuffle. So like, I don't really wanna talk right now, so I can hit the shuffle button. Um, or if somebody has to leave early, uh, you just click the little X and poof off the, you know, they're off the list. So uh, very simple, very, you know, if not everybody wants to talk, they can, they don't have to enter their name. Um, this doesn't require any permissions other than the ability to upload an app. So if you want to try this, you know, it's it's very low overhead in terms of administrative consents and stuff like that. So let's take a look at the code. And by the way, let me paste the info on this into the chat. So what we have is uh, maybe load the meeting participants. Yeah, I thought about that. And maybe we'll do that in the future. That would require a fair amount of graph permission. And I'm a big fan of the graph. But the process to get that deployed inside of Microsoft so we could use it in our own team is a fairly lengthy IT compliance review as, you know, kind of understandable. But just saying we decided to just keep it really simple for this version. So you can see here I have pasted in the, uh, the code, the article. There's a blog article and a video about all of this. So let's uh, take a look at the code. And... Um, what you'll see here is the first thing I had to do, and this is the way Teams Toolkit works. It gives you this little manifest template, and all this stuff is going to get filled in. It's pretty cool. You can have different environments, so you could have a local, a developer, a production, staging environments. It manages all that for you and builds the uh, manifest for the particular environment that you're running right now. I really love that. And there's a couple things I had to do. So first is the configurable tab. So that's the tab that you're seeing. And then that had to be marked as working in a meeting chat in the meeting details or the side panel, which is mainly what we're using. 
And then we had to add these extra authorizations. These don't require special administrative consent. These are just resource specific consents, meaning that anybody in the meeting can get to this live share session. So basically it's a, if you look under the tabs, it is a React app, which is what you get with Teams Toolkit normally in Visual Studio Code anyway, is a React app using Create React App from Facebook, which I really like because it might be the only thing I like about Facebook. Did I say that out loud? But anyway, it's it's a nice structure for building a React app. And it's consistent and it takes care of all the dependencies for you. So that was kind of a nice way to go. And here's the config page. And all this does is it just sort of, when you click the, the save button, it's gonna go ahead and register the actual location of the app. So it needs that URL and you could put some configuration steps in here. I have an alternative version of this that uses the config page a little bit more, uh, which if we have time, I'll talk about that. And then here's the actual React app and, and Rabia wrote the UI and all those cool animation effects and all that stuff is from Rabia. So I wanna, we really had fun working on this together. And so I'm not going to go into that too much, except to show that there's this thing called a fluid service that we're connecting to, and then using that to get the person list. And then whenever anything happens in the UI, it's going over to this fluid component. And so here's the fluid live share component. And because I write samples in JavaScript so that more people can use them and understand them, but I really kind of prefer TypeScript, I put the TypeScript interface in here just so that you can see what the service does. And... So it just allows you to connect and then add, remove, go to the next, those same things that you saw in the UI, right? So how does this work? Well, it uses the fluid framework, which is fundamentally, let me see if I can find the right tab for this. The fluid framework handles distributed data structures. So there's all kinds of different distributed data structures that you can use. In this case, we chose to just use a simple key value pair, and we're only using one and storing the list of, of people, which is just an array in JavaScript, serializing that into this one value. Now there are other data structures that are useful in other situations. And you might think that a sequence would be the best way. There's a sequence data structure that will keep things in order for you across multiple, you know, th this is basically synchronizing in the background inside of the fluid service. So the sequence seemed like the way to go, except for you can't, change the sequence, it's immutable. So all you can do is add and remove, add new ones at the end, remove from the end. It's a proper queue, you can't shuffle, you can't remove somebody from the middle. So that's why we decided on this. There is a race condition here. If two people click the button at the same instant and it was particularly unlucky, one of them might overwrite the other's changes. But I think you have to kind of think about your use case. You know, if this was runners in a race, we would get the sequence, We would it would be invariant, and we would absolutely want it to be perfect. In this case, if you click the button, I've never seen it actually happen. We use this all the time. You had to click the button again, not the end of the world, right? So it seemed like this gave us a lot more flexibility. And then just to kind of show you how this works, when you connect, you go to the live share SDK, and that gives you something called a live share host. From there, you can create a number of different things. But what I'm going to create is a fluid framework container, which is where that shared data structure lives. Now, I'm not gonna have time to go into it, but we have an alternative sample in the repo, which is for Azure. So you can host the fluid framework in Azure if you prefer. The difference being, if you do it in Azure, security is on you. So you completely control security or you don't have any. Whereas with a live share client, it automatically permissions the container to the members of the meeting, the people who are active in the meeting, which is just a beautiful thing, happens to be exactly the permissions that I wanted. So that's what we're doing here, is just getting this container and putting in there a shared map of people. And then you can see that we're just gonna go ahead and get that initial value because Hey, there might are the meeting might already be in progress. So somebody comes online and this code is running. It's going to pull the current state of those people. And then whenever somebody changes something in the UI, we're going to run this value changed event is going to fire if it happens in any UI. And so this is a really important thing to understand is normally in a React app, 
you would modify, you would click something or do something in the UI and it would update the state of that app. We're not exactly doing that. You update something, you click something in the React app and it goes to this service and updates the shared data structure. And then when the shared data structure updates, then we, just like all the other people in the meeting, even if it was me who clicked it, my local code is going to get that update from Fluid. And that way we're guaranteed to all be in sync all the time, right? And then when only when I see the update from Fluid do I actually update the UI. So if I uh, am in here and I'm, you know, and I add Hugo to the list, Hugo didn't show up because I hit enter. Hugo showed up because I hit enter, it updated the fluid container and the fluid container told me there was a change. And then my code told the UI to update based on that whole chain of, of events happening. So most of the code is really just like, manipulate the local array and then update fluid, right? So it's really simple at that point. All these little functions are very, very short and simple. And when we need to update fluid, we're going to call this little piece of code that stringifies the, the array and set in one line to update the shared data structure. So um, it's really simple. It's, it's a great alternative to say screen sharing because screen sharing is like a read only thing, right? One person gets to share everybody else they can care but they can't share right one at a time whereas with this you can kind of build co-authoring into any app if if you think about it so you know that's basically it uh it's a pretty simple app we tried to keep it simple i wasn't sure i'd have time but here's the azure version so you'll see there's another readme and another couple of folders here under tabs and basically this is just the same thing except for the service is an Azure based service. And so we have to go in and use the Azure client. Um, I love the name of this token provider that they give us just to remind us that security is on, on you and not them. They called it the insecure token provider. Either that or these are very introverted tokens that don't really like being shown in a, in a, in a call, a community call. So sorry about that, um, bad joke. But anyway, it's otherwise pretty much the same, just the way that we're getting the container is slightly different. And so that's it for the demo. I encourage you all to go check this out and um, pass it along to the next. Joel. Thank you, Bob. Yes, we are right on the schedule. Thank you for that. Uh, it's always really, really good, so we don't run out of time. Excellent, really, really cool stuff. Then let's jump on right deep, uh, Shanta, uh, to talk about the latest and cover the latest on the Microsoft Craft connectors. Hello, hi everyone. Thanks, Vesa. I'll just um, share my screen quickly. Hey everyone, so this is Rajdeep. I'm from the Microsoft Graph Connectors team. And I'm joined by Mahesh uh, from the team as well. So today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft Graph Connectors and some latest updates. And we also would like to discuss with you and uh, gather some insights around Cloud SSA and Teams content in Microsoft Search. So for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with Microsoft Search and Graph Connectors, we are going to do a brief introduction and then we'll move on with the other agenda, right? So. First of all, what is Microsoft Search? Um, it's an intelligent search for your workplace. Uh, it helps you bring knowledge and expertise that's spread across your workplace into one single place. And the data is secure and private, and you get a consistent search experience across all Microsoft 365 surfaces. So whether you search on SharePoint, whether you search on Bing, whether you search on Windows search box, so everywhere you get a consistent search experience via Microsoft Search. Now, how does Graph Connectors play, play a role in Microsoft Search? Essentially, all your first party content, uh, like your PowerPoint, Word, Excel, Outlook, Teams data, everything is already there in Microsoft Graph. But let's say you have other content as well. That's where Microsoft Graph Connectors come in. Um, so essentially think of a modern organization. So in a modern organization, you would have tons and tons of data that's spread across some file storage, some sales and CRM data, HR data, or you may have some on-prem data sources. So what we see is that average large organizations have 15 to 20 plus systems. 
and employees spend roughly 20% of their time searching and gathering this information so uh, like discovering this information itself across so many systems is difficult let alone analyzing and then using it so this is where graph connectors come into the picture and using graph connectors you can actually bring in the content of all these data sources that are spread across your organization into microsoft graph where your first party content that we talked about that that's the microsoft content already is residing and on top of this you can build or leverage different experiences that are being built so the primary one that we are talking about today is microsoft search but apart from that other experiences like viva topics security and compliance people experiences recommendations feeds these are also going to come in the future and some of these are already in preview so if you would like to know more about this or talk about this with us so feel free to reach out and we can see how we can help you out here so moving on from graph connectors so we want to share a few updates for those of you who have already used or are using graph connectors so the graph connectors sdk is now generally available so uh, the, uh, the graph connectors sdk is essentially an sdk which helps you create custom connectors for which microsoft or our partners do not have any connectors available it helps you bring in content from your custom data sources easily using a framework that's provided by microsoft apart from that the out of the box connector that's developed by microsoft which is the adio wiki connector is also now generally available for you to use connector results are now available on bing all tab so earlier connector results were only available in your search or the custom verticals that we that you are creating for each of your data sources now these connector results are also are, are available apart from the work tab in your um, all tab as well so earlier we had some limitations around how much content you can bring in from each of your data sources so over there we have made really good progress and we have increased the each connection limit that you create from for your data sources to more than 5 million items in each connections and the number of connections that you can create at a tenant level has gone up from 10 to 30 so if any of you have high scale requirements of bringing in items please reach out to us and we can work together and figure out how we can support you apart from that connector content is now available in teams mobile for ios and are coming on other uh, platforms as well very soon we have also rolled out an improved connector analytics experience which helps you analyze much more data shows more graphs more reports for you to easily download and analyze and uh, see what's going on in the search space in your organization so these are some of the experiences that are generally available as of now it's available for everyone and you can use so interleaving experience which essentially when you search it brings in the content and interleaves according to the relevance between your first party microsoft results and your third party connector results together in search in the all tab that's called interleaving and it's currently in preview so if any of you is interested in having this experiences previewing it and trying it out please do reach out to us so i'll move on from the from this discussion to hand it off to mahesh for a, a brief discussion on cloud ssa and graph connectors mahesh would you like to take over hey, thanks rajdeep yeah so a quick recap uh, around cloud ssa so cloud ssa as you know is an existing mechanism to get third party data into sharepoint search uh, it will allow users across on prem search canvas and sharepoint online canvases to access the hybrid search index Uh, however it will need uh, some significant resources to keep it running and does not truly really help uh, the customer to move away from a on prem sharepoint server farm so if you already have on prem uh, sharepoint server farm you still have to keep a lot of it still running in order to run a cloud ssa and also if uh, you have to ingest any new kind of content there is a significant amount of investment in building that connector using the bcs services so that's a quick recap around what cloud ssa is i wanted to take a stab on how graph connectors are a better option so graph connectors is a great way as rajiv already told to bring in on prem and third party content which is difficult in some ways with cloud ssa so now we have got great support for both cloud uh, and on prem content including on prem file shares 
And in terms of experiences, uh, Microsoft Search is the key experience and uh, okay, interleaving is in preview as well as uh, a lot of relevance tuning uh, options are available with graph connectors. And obviously, uh, okay, all uh, the graph connectors content get to participate in the new experiences like Viva Topics, Centillion Discovery, like recommendations in Office Feed and eDiscovery. And so that is going to go even better uh, okay, okay in times to come where okay whereas for cloud ssa it will be difficult to give parity on these experiences following that with uh, on the content side uh, we have got great out of the box and partner built connector support for over 150 data sources now uh, and uh, as rajib already mentioned we uh, recently went uh, live with the graph connectors sdk which enables anyone to quickly develop new connectors uh, for a line of business data sources or any application you would like to uh, yeah, sort of plug into search. Uh, it uses uh, okay, less on-prem resources and infra, which makes it easier to manage. And our graph connectors get uh, continuous upgrades and improvement, which uh, make it a very sustainable choice for anyone to maintain over a longer period of time. Yeah, so I think what the, the, yes, the message that we want to get is that uh, graph connectors are a better emerging solution to bring in any non-SharePoint, non-native content into search and other experiences. Yeah, and I would uh, like to share a quick survey link uh, uh, for uh, getting some feedback on how are you or your customers using okay, Cloud SSA in your landscape. So please do uh, share your feedback uh, on that. Quick uh, change of gear. So we wanted to briefly uh, get your views on how uh, Teams content uh, can be brought into Microsoft Search. Uh, so graph connectors are now available in Teams Mobile, in iOS devices, in custom verticals. Uh, more devices and better experience support is going to follow very soon. Uh, and at the same time, there is a growing content base within Teams apps where users are continuously creating and sharing more content. So yeah, it's getting richer by the day. So we would like to know your views and uh, your inputs if your organization or your customers uh, would like to search for this Teams app content in Microsoft Search. Uh, if yes, uh, please feel free to use the same survey form that I shared earlier, and uh, we would like to know on how best these team apps can participate. Uh, okay, what options you would like from them uh, to let them participate into search? But, okay, and we would like to see how graph connectors can help in that journey. I think that's Thanks it from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Rajiv, right, and thank you, team. Uh, really good input. Uh, let's fill in the form. Uh, let's put that one explicitly called out on the chat a few times. I think Masha has already shared that. Thank you for that. Uh, and then I think it's time for move to you, Stefan. Now uh, we can see you on the screen. Uh, let's do screen sharing and move forward from there. Yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. So at the beginning of March, I noticed that they were doing a graph API hackathon Oh, 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 sorry, 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 Stefan. I do apologize. Uh, I have a message from Waldek. He wants to say a word before we actually start the demo <laughs> for you. Waldek, you need to be more specific yeah. on this request. It, sorry for that. It took, yeah, it let's took a minute let's to uh, rewind, to arrive a bit, right? <laughs> now, Waldek is here to do a quick recap on what the hackathon was all about, and then we'll move to the one of the winners within a hackathon. Waldek, take it away. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, Stefan. So. As Stefan already said, at the beginning of March, we ran a virtual hackathon for Microsoft Graph and .NET. And the idea was to let people experience what they can do with Microsoft Graph and .NET. And we've seen so many, so many cool hacks people do, and few of us uh, really picked our attention. And while the hack that you will see today didn't quite win, it was really, really cool because on March 1, the graph team did a release of a brand new SDK. And what the person did, our guest here today, they improved the SDK. So without further ado, let's see how that SDK was improved even better to let developers across the world achieve even more with the Microsoft Graph. Evan, over to you. 
Thanks, Waldek, for your introduction. So there was a hackathon, and uh, we've been a long time member of the uh, batch endpoint. Uh, we've been using it even before it was supported in any SDK. It's been supported in the SDK for some time now. And I saw the hackathon and I thought, yeah, maybe I should try it out to see if current SDK would solve our needs. But before we were using our own client to do the batching and to get higher throughput. Um, and there were some things missing. So I decided, yeah, why not? extend the SDK so everybody else can start using the new batching endpoint and to be even more efficient in their code. Um, the new graph SDK is also not yet supported by the templates that you get if you do a .NET new WebAssembly. So I also extended uh, or I fixed the templates so you can get along with Graft v5 in Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, I made a small demo in the browser. This is just a WebAssembly app that talks directly to the Graft API, so there's no server around. It's hosted on Azure Static Web Apps. And I just want to show you how things are can be speed up if you use the batching instead of the normal endpoints. So I have a to-do part. Uh, here you can see my to-do list. It's empty. I made a special list just for this. You can try this out yourself. Everybody can log in. It's configured as multi-tenant, so feel free to try it out. It, there's nothing fishy going on. You can check the source. It's in the chat. And I'm going to show you what it does. I already created the list, so I'm going to load the ID. We need that later, but we only need to load it once. Let's see. I can open the uh, developer tab. I'm gonna uh, make it bigger in a little bit, uh, but first I'm gonna start by adding uh, 10 random tasks to my to-do list. Hopefully graft works. And I can see it added 10 items and it took roughly two seconds. If I check the to-do list, you can see those items they are just created uh, with the UTC timestamp of the moment. And it takes uh, 1.99 uh, seconds, so let's call it two seconds to um, add those items to the API. And if I open this, you can see it actually does several tasks where it does a call to the API and then adds the task. But it's 10 items, so 10 calls. Now I'm going to delete those. It fetches the list and then deletes them in uh, 1.5 seconds. They're, they're empty in the list. And if I show the uh, results, you can see that it does 10 delete requests and 10 option requests. Uh, those are mandatory. We cannot get rid of them. So two seconds for adding 10 items, 1.5 seconds for deleting those 10 items. And you can see it's empty right now. Now I'm going to do the same with the uh, with batching. So this way you can still see the text below and adding 10 items only took me 0 0.6 seconds. If I make the network part a little bit bigger, you should see that it's doing several batch requests. And within a batch request, there are four tasks created at the same time. There's currently a limit that you can only do four tasks in a single batch, else it will crash, but that will hopefully get fixed very soon. Yeah, from two seconds down to 0 0.6 seconds. So that's roughly two and a half times faster, and it's only for 10 items. And it, it will go up, uh, the speed improvement will go up if you have more items. 
you can still see them here, nothing fishy, but the order is changed because before I was adding them sequentially, so the zero one would be at the bottom, but now I combine four requests in a single batch and the order is undetermined. There's eight, nine, five. So it's the ren the order is shaped because of the uh, batch requests. If I now delete those items, it only takes like uh, 0 0.5 seconds and it's down from uh, 1.5 seconds. So that's also roughly three times faster. This is why I want everybody to use batching. And I also want everybody to use Blazor because then you don't need a server part to make an application that talks to the graph API. I shared all the links in the chat before. You can see the code from uh, my graph explorer here. Uh, if you want, you can see what you need to change on the template for uh, using the graph v5 API. So this is .NET template, uh, .NET new Blazor WebAssembly, and then you need to change these things. 26 additions, 45 deletions. So it's really small change to get started with the graph API in .NET Blazor WebAssembly. This was my original idea. The default batching, you could do this, make a batch request, add up to 20 requests, and adding request 21 made it fail. My contribution was the batch request content collection, and that uh, automatically splits up the requests uh, until the max amount of requests you want to combine. Uh, and I saw some people from Microsoft already, already using it. And Waldeck, he mentioned this to this other uh, members of his team. And they started to create issues. Hey, did you see this, um, this great hack? Uh, maybe we should integrate this into the Graft SDK. And then things went on from there. Uh, I made a pull request for the Graft SDK. It got accepted like within a day. And after that, they created issues to use this same methodology in other SDKs as well. So my code, my idea is going to be used by all you guys. This was the demo that I had on the Graft API. Are there any questions on this part? Acute questions, how does it deal with 429 errors? That's actually a really good question from Hugo. Let's actually cover that then. Then we can yeah, that, close up. That's a, that's a great question. I was also aware of this issue that you could not handle the 429 errors correctly. So I made an additional uh, pull request to allow you to uh, get all the status codes for a single batch, and then you can validate them and retry them yourself if you want to retry all the 429 errors. But this part is not yet automated. Now, related on that one, Stefan, let's talk about that one a bit. So is it going to work in a kind of a transactional way? So is it are we going to get 429 in one of the calls in a patch, or is it a one patch, yes or no? Do you know how it's going to handle that? Um, it's going to handle all the individual requests are counted against the, against the batch. Correct. Um, so that's why you, the, the batch can only be 20 requests, a single batch. But for the tasks endpoint, there seems to be an issue where you can only do four requests. And that was also the reason why I created this additional pull request. Uh, so you can set, I want to combine only four requests in a single batch request. And then you, the, those four will succeed. So that's what I needed for the demo. But in all other cases, if you have more if the batch limit, for instance, in task, it's four. If I combine six requests, four will succeed and two will fail with the four to nine. Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's, they it's, are individually counted against the limit. Correct. Correct. So, so just to be super clear on that, they're basically handled individually. So the batch itself is not a transactional bundle. Every single call within the batch will be sent to the server side and then they're executed one by one. And for individual execution of those calls, you might get a 429 as well. 
yes, or a 400 or, or whatever exactly. error yeah, yeah, you get. And the batch will still succeed. So you cannot check the status codes of the batch because the batch is received correctly. Uh, yep. But individual requests might be unsuccessful, and that can be checked with uh, my latest addition to the SDK as well. Yeah, which is really, really cool. So you're able to double check that, okay, what, did all of those requests go through properly, or was there any any challenges related to any of them? So really, really cool. Awesome improvements, and, and really shows the power of community as well. So thank you, Stefan, on this one. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, and thank you for additional questions. and and. Yeah, I see, I see there's a, one more question yeah. from Hugo, and that's uh, what we covered before. Um, it does not uh, automatically retry, but with the latest pull request, you can easily manage uh, retrying a failed request in your batch request by creating a new batch request from the failed batch request yeah. with the response codes included. So there's in the patching, there's no automatic retry or but then the client side, it depends on how the SDK handles that. And Stefan has been now improving still continuously the SDK. So thank you for that one. Yeah. So really, really cool. Awesome stuff. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Now I will move back in the slides uh, so we can close a few minutes early this time. And that's actually really positive because typically people are back to back on meetings. So having a few minutes break every now and then is really good. Now, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Rajib, uh, and and friends. And thank you, Stefan. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Uh, awesome demos once again today. Uh, next week, our agenda is already uh, in high level set. Uh, we need to define a few presenters there. But on 11th of April, uh, we'll have Aisha and Carrie talking about announcing of a Teams Toolkit Cloud Skill Challenge. Um, and then uh, John Miller related on that one is going to talk about the Microsoft Teams Toolkit. There's a lot of, lot of great improvements over there. The version 5 is now in preview. There's new improvements in 4.2.4 and so on. So a lot of, lot of cool stuff in there. And then uh, we kind of cover the Microsoft Craft Hackathon being a demo number two. So again, it's not necessary that the person was second in the hackathon, but it will be one of the one of the presenters from the top four, uh, which will be demoed within the community calls. Thank you for that. Now, we would love uh, to get feedback around these calls as well. Um, a typical setup, uh, we as a Microsoft employees, we always ask for feedback. But if you would have a few minutes, two minutes, uh, fill in the form and let us know uh, about these community calls, how the community calls are going, and how we can improve. So if there's some areas where you must, you think we should improve, let us know. Uh, and obviously, positive feedback is also welcome. Thank you, David, for pasting in the link in the chat. Other than that, uh, the recording of this community call will be available within the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community YouTube channel within 24 hours. Um, you cannot access the community call directly from the Teams chat. Uh, that's unfortunately not possible uh, because only Microsoft employees can actually do that from this Teams chat recording. But that's why we are publishing the community call in the YouTube channel within 24 hours. Follow us on Twitter. This is where to stay up to date on, on when the calls are also available. And the next call is on April 11th, as mentioned. If you're looking into downloading recurrent invites for the existing calls, it's DPS, AKMS community, and forward slash calls. That's the easiest way to remember that. But that's it for now. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Awesome stuff and see you next week. Uh, we do have one more call this week at least happening. Hopefully we'll see you there. If not, uh, hopefully next Tuesday. Thanks everybody. Cheers.